and today we're going to look at power calculations. What happens with inductors, capacitors, and resistors when it comes to power? First thing I'm going to indicate here is a very useful trig identity, and that is that sine A times sine B is equal to one half times the quantity cosine of A minus B minus cosine A plus B. All right, so here's where we're going to start. Let's consider the case for a simple resistor. All right, so this is going to be the resistive case over here. Take a look at a voltage and a current. We know that the current and the voltage are in phase with a resistor. So if we were to say our voltage as a function of time is some peak value V times sine of 2 pi FT, you would have an associated current that equals some peak value I times the sine of 2 pi FT. Right? There's no phase shift between these two things. Now, if we were to draw those two waveforms, right, we would see something like this. Right? So that would be, could be the current waveform, the voltage waveform. Right? The other one, and I'm going to draw it right below it, because they're perfectly in phase, right? just so that you can see that there's two waves here. All right, looks something like that. So now what we want to do is multiply these two waveforms together. All right, so utilizing this, all right, so uh, A and B in this case would both be the 2 pi FT. So our uh, identity would indicate that the result, which is our power basically, would be one half times the uh, two constant values, VI, or VI over two if you prefer. Okay, and that's gonna be times A minus B, which of course would be zero, so we get cosine of zero. And that's gonna be minus cosine of A plus B, which is basically two times this, in other words, it's the cosine of 2 times 2 pi ft. All right, what does that look like? Well, the cosine of 0 is just 1. Okay. So that's basically uh, vi over 2 minus vi over 2 times the cosine of 2 pi 2 ft. So this is just a... Um, a negative cosine wave is really just a shifted, a 90 degree shifted uh, sine wave at, in this case, twice the frequency. So if I were to multiply the two waveforms here together, sort of graphically, right? Zero here, zero here. Here we have a nice peak, so we're going to get something that kind of goes up like this and then comes back down. And then the same thing over here, two negatives will give us positives again. And what we see is essentially our negative cosine wave, starting here, coming up, and it's sitting on a DC offset, right? So this, this cosine of one-half of VI is basically the offset, and then this piece over here is the AC quantity, right? So we're saying that power is basically this AC waveform riding on a DC waveform. Now, what's the average of that, right? Because that's ultimately what I care about, right? What the heck is P out here? Well, it is a function of time, but uh, physical devices are not going to be able to heat up and cool down with normal waveforms. You know, um, if this was, a, let's say, a 100 hertz, 1 kilohertz, 1 megahertz waveform, right, this power waveform, a device like a resistor or a transistor is not going to heat up and cool down that quickly any more than if you had a, uh, you know, a fry pan and you put it on the stove, 
it doesn't immediately come to temperature. And when you take it off, it doesn't immediately cool off, right? There's a thermal time constant associated with that. So basically, we find the average of this. Well, the average, because this is a sine wave, the positive peaks sort of fill the negative valleys, if you will, and the average value is just this constant. In other words, it's Vi over 2. Right? Now remember, that's peak value times peak value. Normally, we would do power calculations with RMS values. So the RMS value of V would be V divided by square root of 2. The same thing would be true with I, and be I over the square root of 2. So it's VI over the square root of 2 times the square root of 2, which is, of course, 2. So it's just the peak voltage times the peak current divided by 2. That's the power that we get in our resistor. Now, that's what we call true power, right? This terminology will become a little bit more obvious in a moment. So true power P is measured in watts. And the symbol we use for watts, of course, is W, right? True power. All right. Now let's turn our attention to the um, purely reactive case. Okay, so this over here is going to be the case of either a capacitor or an inductor. All right. What do we have in terms of uh, waveforms for this? Well, um, if we took, again, some current I, well, you, we can use the current as our uh, reference, if you will. That would be some peak value, sine 2 pi ft, and then the associated current, depending on whether it's an inductor or a capacitor, will be a, a sine wave that's 90 degree out. All right, so that would be sine 2 pi ft plus or minus 90 degrees. So our sine wave for the current would look something like this. A little lumpy, but you get the idea. And then for the voltage, if we were to assume uh, it was um, shifted this way, Right, we would wind up with something like that. All right. Okay, so we get a 90 shift, or it could be shifted the other way. All right, so you, you kind of went this way. Either way, so now we turn our attentions and say, well, when I multiply these two together, what do we get? Well, we are going to get for our power equation. Still have the VI over here. Still have the one half, so I'm just going to put that together. VI over 2. Now, um, A over here would be the 2 pi F. Okay. B would be the 2 pi F plus or minus 90 degrees. Or you could actually think of that as A, the A part, plus or minus 90 degrees. In other words, just a little sort of add-on there. All right. So A minus B would simply be the 90 degrees. In other words, you have the cosine of plus or minus 90 degrees. Now, it's not really going to make any difference whether it's positive or negative because cosine is, of course, symmetric around zero. So we have that piece of it. What's the other part work out to? Well, that's going to be a negative cosine wave, kind of like what we had over here, doubled up 2 pi ft, but again, plus or minus this 90 degrees. So we basically have... Um, a sine wave, essentially, right? Because I've had negative cosine shift at 90 degrees. I have a sine wave. Here's my AC part. Here's my uh, constant part. So what is the cosine of 90 degrees? Well, it's zero, as mentioned. So all we get is this part of it. In other words, all we get is VI over 2 times the sinusoidal function. And if we were to draw that, it's going to look something like this. Okay, so this is zero. That's zero. So right in here, we're going to get a peak. Same thing over here, zero and zero. Here, we're going to get a negative peak. Now we're kind of repeating the process. Two negatives gets us the positive, and then a positive and a negative, and there we go. So what we see here 
is again a double frequency sine wave, right? Sinusoid, double frequency, but there's no DC offset. So what's the average of this, right? What's the average for this? Well, again, over a full cycle, it's going to average out to be zero. In other words, for half the cycle, it's dissipating power. For the other half of the cycle, it's generating. It's like taking a spring, a compression spring, and squeezing it down. You're working, and then you let it go, and it's releasing that, right? An ideal spring would work like that. All right, so what are we going to call this? I mean, we come up with a, we could come up with a number, you know, a VI over 2, cosine blah, blah, blah. What do we call that? Well, we refer to this as reactive power. It's a different sort of thing, right? It is, in fact, imaginary. You know, just like we have an impedance that's an imaginary and a value that's real over here. So it's the same kind of thing, reactive power. Now, we give this a different symbol. We call this Q. The units for this are volts, amps, reactive. or VAR for short, V-A-R, okay? All right, so there's no true power dissipated in our inductor capacitor. Now, turn our attention finally to a complex impedance, right? Some combination of resistance and reactance. What do we see there? Well, a very similar sort of situation. We have a current peak value I, sine 2 pi FT, got a voltage, capital V, sine 2 pi FT, but now, instead of being at 90 degrees, it's at some angle, right? It's some value, plus or minus theta. Well, what is theta? Basically, theta, we're going to set this up so that theta is the impedance angle, right? So if, um, if we think of Z, is being V over I, right? The um, voltage angle here will be the impedance angle, right? Theta is the impedance angle. Okay, so what does this look like? Again, if I take my current waveform, it's going to come up to a peak like this, and go like so. And now we turn our attention to the voltage waveform. So again, theta could be anywhere from 0 to 90, plus or minus, right? So let's pick something that's um, kind of halfway in between these two, right? I'll take the blue and I'll kind of, from this, I'll kind of shift it a, a little bit this way. So we maybe end up with something that kind of goes like this. And then we, again, multiply these two things together. All right, so there's our the zero value here. We got a zero value here, so we're going to get um, a little bit of a sine, sine lump there. Um, we then have still have positive and negative here, so we get a little bit there, and then this sort of continues along the way. All right, and what I have here is a sine wave. Not the best drawing in the world, but it's a sine wave that's slightly shifted up, right? So it'd be like the center point is like around here somewhere. Okay. When we look at our equation, what we find down here for PT Once again, there's that VI over 2. And now we have cosine theta. All right, minus this um, cosine double frequency. Well, the interesting bit, here's the AC, right? But the interesting bit is back here. And that's this VI uh, over 2 times cosine of theta. That's the true power. That, that's the offset. That's the the true power part of this. So it's literally a combination of these two things. So we could say that the 
true power portion, if you will, of this is equal to vi over 2 times the cosine of theta. Now, if we were to just um, sort of take a circuit, measure a voltage, measure a current flowing through this circuit, th flowing through this load, we would have something we call apparent power. In other words, if we literally just said, hey, what's VI over 2? Forget about cosine theta. In other words, as if we did it over here. We have something called apparent power, because that's what it appears to be. If you just got a DMM out, you measured the load voltage, you measured the load current and RMS values, and you multiplied them together, you would have this quantity called apparent power S. Right? So it's sort of a naive calculation, because the DMM uh, has no way of indicating what the phase shift is. Right? And that will make, obviously, a difference. Um, so that's what it appears to be, and we call it apparent power. S has units of volt amps. Okay. Um, not volt amp reactive, just volt amps. And we abbreviate that as VA. All right. So this is really a combination of the two things. Now what we can do is look at this in terms of uh, like, a, like a phasor diagram, basically. I'll take something like this. So we could have a true power. I'll tell you what, change some colors here. We could have a true power out like this. All right, that's P. And then we might have some reactive power, Q. Now remember, theta is the impedance angle, so if I have something going positive, this is an inductive Q, right? So this is Q up here, it's inductive. If it was down here, it would be capacitive. So I have that combo, right? So I'll just do another one down here and say, okay, this is a Q for a capacitor. Now, the vector summation of these things would be S. So same thing down here. All right, so in this case, S is inductive. In this case, S is capacitive, OK? We would usually refer to an inductive um, angle on this, the Q that's inductive, we would say that's a, a lagging value. Capacitor is leading. Again, that's a relationship between the, the uh, current and voltage, right? So an inductor, we call it lagging because the current lags the voltage, right? Current can't change instantaneously in an inductor. In a capacitor, we would call that leading because the current leads the voltage. The voltage can't change instantaneously for a capacitor, right? Now, a simpler way of doing this is to just sort of forget about the axes for a moment and just look at the, the parts. We make a little triangle out of this. This is called a power triangle. So I'd say, okay, here's my real power, P. There is some value, Q, and I'm just drawing it up. It could just as easily go down. And then there is the S value, right? The apparent power. So this is just basic um, right angle trigonometry over here. We could say that uh, knowing, for example, S and the impedance angle theta, you could say that P, true power, would have to equal S times the cosine of theta. You could also reword this, reform this, and say that P over S, the ratio of true power to apparent power, and that's a useful thing, right, is equal to cosine theta. And that's so useful, we give it a special name, we call that power factor, usually abbreviated as PF. We could also find, using our right angle trig, we could also find the value of the reactive power Q, that would be S times the sine of theta. 
And then we could use the Pythagorean theorem, for example, to find s if we knew p and q, right? That would be the square root of p squared plus q squared. Q squared. Um, similarly, we could find theta, that's just the arctangent, opposite of or over adjacent of q over p. Okay, so to recap, what we have is a purely resistive case where we see the orange power versus time curve. This has an average value that's just equal to um, the peak values divided by 2. Right? It's pure power, true power, units are watts. Call that P. We have the purely reactive case for uh, an ideal inductor or capacitor, in which case we find out that there is no DC offset. This is alternately absorbing and releasing power, if you will. We call that product, uh, the, v, the, the same thing, the VI over 2, as reactive power. We give that the symbol Q. It has units of volt amp reactive, or VAR. Finally, we have the complex case for Z, some combination of resistance and reactance, in which case we find that the signal is offset somewhat, but not fully. Right? So we basically have a little area down here in this, in this particular case where um, there, some, some energy is being sort of thrown back into the circuit, right? in which case we find that the true power component of this is VI over 2 times cosine of theta. The apparent power is just VI over 2, right? because it appears to be that way from a naive uh, measurement. Um, units for this, units for S, are volt amps, right, VA, and we can reduce this down into something called a power triangle where we can uh, exploit our right angle trig rules to find the various components. If we had the sort of rectangular version, if we had P and Q, we could find S and theta. If we had S and theta, similarly, we could find P and Q. The one particular um, item that's of importance is the ratio of true power to apparent power that is cosine theta, we call that the power factor. As we'll see soon in a following video, very often we like systems to have power factor of unity. In other words, the true and the apparent powers are identical, as that will make the circuit uh, more effective for us. We won't have to draw as much current in that case. And we'll look at that in a future video.